Anand Mahadevan, pastor of New City Church, Mumbai, encourages all believers to explore and fall in love with the Old Testament. In this message, Finding Christ in the Old Testament. Good morning, everyone. Such a joy uh, to be here uh, again. Uh, I always look forward to uh, come to All People Church because uh, I'm always looking uh, to learn. Uh, New City Church, the church that uh, I pastor in Mumbai, is only about three years old, and we're about a community of about 80 people. Uh, so I have much to learn. Um, I, learn um, I look to learn from APC, not just because it's, it's a bigger church, uh, but more so because I found that it's also a very thoughtful church. And every time I've met Pastor Ashish, I've always been impressed by how thoughtful and how strategic, and at the same time, how led by the Spirit uh, he is. So this morning, that, that declaration that you all stood up and read out, I was taking notes, you know, things that, something that I can learn, uh, I can go back and do at the church uh, that, that, that I lead. So, so I always look forward to coming here uh, to, to learn. Uh, I'll talk about my book in just a little bit, uh, but I have just one goal this morning for us, and this is what I have been praying for all of us. My single goal today is to is to help all of us fall in love with the Old Testament. Uh, my goal this morning is to create in each of our hearts a new sense of wonder for the Old uh, Testament. If I were to describe, if I were asked to describe the Old, Old Testament in, in one sentence, this is what I would say. All of the Old Testament is all about Christ Jesus, the Messiah, who was to come. Uh, like the sermon I'm going to be preaching today, one of the biggest goals of my book, uh, The Grace of God and Flaws of Men, is that everyone who reads the book should fall in love with the Old Testament. The book itself is a study of the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, but a study with a difference, the entire book is only above their flaws and their failures. 16, 17 chapters, every single chapter of the book, looking only at their flaws and their failures. And through their flaws and failures, I've tried to present the transforming grace of God. And one of the things I, I really believe and something that I've been praying for the book is that the book will coach people, anyone who reads the book, uh, it will coach them to read the Old Testament well, and, and help them to see Christ Jesus shining beautiful in all of the Old Testament. So if the Holy Spirit moves you this morning, moves your heart this morning through the sermon, he will very likely also use the book to bless you even more. Uh, this morning, I want to preach on uh, Rachel and Leah and Jacob, and I'm so happy you have that premarital course counseling coming up on August 25th because you don't want to learn about marriage from this family. You don't want to learn about marriage from Jacob. So, so I'm relieved that uh, after we spend looking uh, sometime this morning looking at their lives, you have a, a, a premarital course uh, that's coming. For those of us uh, for whom if this is your first time in a church kind of a context, you may never have uh, read the Bible before, I'm going to just take a minute to, to give us a little bit of a context in who these people are and why we are looking at their lives and how uh, their story, uh, even though it happened hundreds of years ago, can be relevant and helpful uh, even to you uh, here and now. The Bible talks about uh, a couple um, named Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, they had twin sons, Esau and Jacob. Jacob was the younger, younger of the two of the twins. And he stole elder, brother's, elder brother Esau's birthright uh, by cheating his father. And so a murderous Esau drove Jacob away to another country. And running away from his brother, Jacob in a new country meets a, a very shrewd shepherd, a man named Laban. Uh, he was a relative of his mother. Now Laban had two daughters, Rachel and Leah. Rachel was extraordinarily beautiful. In Genesis chapter 29, verse 17, the Bible uses surprising language to describe Rachel. And this is what the Bible says. Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. 
But Leah was ugly. And no sooner he does he reach this new country and, and takes refuge in the, in, in the home uh, of, of Laban, Jacob becomes romantically obsessed with Rachel. Laban, who's very shrewd, he figures this out. And he tricks Jacob into working for him for seven years with Rachel as a reward, with Rachel as a salary. And at the end of seven years, uh, Laban tricks Jacob into marrying ugly Leah. And uh, Jacob is shocked, but Laban says, you work for me another seven years and you can marry Rachel too. And so Jacob works another seven years and, and, and wins Rachel's hand in, in marriage. So Jacob has two wives. And not surprisingly, because Rachel is incredibly beautiful and Leah is ugly, Jacob's love for Rachel is greater than his love for Leah. Two sisters married to a same man. One sister is beautiful and another is ugly. This is a recipe for disaster. And the Bible passage we're going to be exploring this morning, studying together this morning, uh, actually narrates the disaster that unfolds in this marriage. Uh, we're going to be reading from Genesis chapter 29. If you have your Bibles or your smartphones, turn to it, or verses will come up for us on screen as well. Genesis chapter 29, verses 31 onwards. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive. But Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. So she named, he, uh, she named him Levi. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1. When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, Give me children or I'll die. Jacob became angry with her and said, Am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? Then she said, Here is Bilhah, my servant. Sleep with her so that you can bear children for me and I too can build a family through her. And we move on to verse 22 from the same chapter. Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son and, and said, God has taken away my disgrace. She named him Joseph and said, may the Lord add to me another son. Allow me to pray for us before we dive in uh, to this passage. Father, we pray uh, that you would send your Holy Spirit to minister to us this morning, Lord. And that all of us together, through this passage, through this portion of your word, we would see Christ Jesus shine beautiful. The beautiful name of Jesus, the powerful name of Jesus that we sung about this morning, Lord, would, would just grip our hearts and change us from inside out through this passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know all of us were silent as, and listening as I was, was reading out this passage for us. But even though you are silent, I know deep inside your heart, there were perhaps two objections that were screaming, that were screaming from within. And I have to deal with these objections before we move into this passage. The first objection is simply this. Does the Bible endorse polygamy? Because Jacob here has two wives, and what more? He has two more servants as well, uh, who are pretty much are given to him as wives. So does the Bible endorse polygamy? The answer is a clear no. The Bible does not endorse polygamy. Polygamy is a sin. Just because the Bible narrates the story of a polygamous man does not mean that the Bible endorses it. 
The Bible also narrates the adultery of many men. That does not mean that the Bible endorses adultery. I think this, this should bring us to consider this one question. What is the Old Testament all about? Sure, the Old Testament has some amazing heroes of faith, but almost all of these men, without exception, also had several flaws in their character that God healed by His grace. Many of the heroes of the Old Testament, like Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, were polygamous, murderous, angry, drunken, and sinful men. But standing tall, standing high, standing beautiful above the flaws of all these men is Christ Jesus, the only man who never sinned, not even once. And so the Bible is the story of, of all of these sinful men who did some atrocious things and who deserved to be punished. But the Bible also presents this one man, Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who was sinless and who should have been blessed by God in every way. The central story of the Bible is this divine exchange that happens where God punished this one perfect man so that he could forgive all other sinful men who would believe in Jesus. So that's what the Bible is all about, and that's the prism, that's the perspective through which we should be reading the Bible. Jesus is how the grace of God covers the flaws of men. So to be absolutely sure, the Bible does not endorse polygamy. The second confession, second, sorry, second objection, uh, I confess, uh, is harder to address, but that's an objection uh, which will rise up from this passage. It's this. Why did God create Rachel as beautiful? And why did God create Leah as ugly? Wasn't God unfair? Why does God create some men and women beautiful and some, and some men and women outright ugly? I want us to consider one thing. Who would you rather be? If you had a choice to be in the shoes of Rachel or be in the shoes of Leah, who would you rather be? Who is more blessed? Who is more likely, in your view, to have a happier life, Rachel or Leah? And I bet all of us would answer Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. We would rather be Rachel than be Leah. I would be really surprised if any of us tells me that I'd rather be Leah. Now, some of us... Maybe that's true to you this morning. Some of us may be feeling like Leah, unloved, despised, rejected, lonely, unwanted. Maybe we're feeling like that now. I get that. That's possible. And we, we will try and um, talk about that some this morning. But we will not willingly make a choice to be like Leah rather than Rachel. I'm going to come back to this thought as I close my talk later, later this morning. Some of us might even argue like this. Why are we make, blaming Jacob here? After all, it's God who made Rachel beautiful, and it's God who made Leah ugly. So how can you find fault with Jacob if he's being partial and if he's loving Rachel and her sons more than he loves Leah and, 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 and her sons? That brings us uh, to reflect a little bit on beauty. By beauty, I mean physical beauty as well. But all of us know, especially in a city like Bangalore or Mumbai from where I come from, that there is also beauty that's associated with success, especially in our careers, an accomplishment. And we all desire that beauty as well as we desire physical beauty. Beauty. Um, what I have for us this morning is, is some photographs of beautiful women from many different cultures in the world. And since we're talking a lot about singles, for all you singles men out here, I'd like you to tell me who do you fancy among all these beautiful women from different cultures, uh, right? I don't think anybody is going for any of these women. They are beautiful in their culture and in their time, but you know, you and I, we're perhaps not going to consider these women as beautiful. That's because human definition of beauty is fickle. 
human definition of beauty changes from season to season. It changes from autumn to fall. Men and women who are considered beautiful at a certain time and age are not going to be considered beautiful now. I mean, today everybody's talking about size zero. Right? I mean, a few centuries ago, if you talked about size zero, you would be completely unwanted. You would feel completely despised. You wouldn't find yourself, you would feel that you're not at all attractive. So my answer to the objection we have on why did God make some people beautiful and some people ugly, like Rachel and Leah, is simply this. Who is a better judge of beauty? Can you and I, as mere transient human beings, are we a better judge of beauty or... A truly transcendental and eternal God, is He a better judge of beauty? You know, many years ago when I was a child, this was probably in the late 80s, I was playing cricket with a few of my friends. And uh, India had just won the World Cup, and, and, and uh, there was a lot of excitement around the World Cup victory. And I remember we were playing on a street, and uh, I thought I was the best cricketer of all. You know, I thought it's just a question of time before I make it to the India team, which is far from truth. Uh, but I believe that, you know, as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, you can believe those things, and I believe that. And so, so I was kind of on the field, strutting around, strutting around, trying to show my skills, and clearly believing I'm head and shoulders about everybody else. And as we were playing, there was this man who walked in. It took me a moment uh, uh, to recognize him, but I did. He was Roger Binney. He, he hails from Karnataka, I think. He was Roger Binney. And he was a, a very crucial member of the Indian team that won the World Cup in 1983. And he began, he walked in, introduced himself, said hi to us, and started playing with us. And the moment he came and walked into the field, everything changed. I was not the best cricketer on that field, even in my own assessment. The moment he came into the picture, perspective changed, understanding changed, everything changed. I think that's a great illustration for us to understand beauty in the context of God. In God's sight, in His standard of beauty, in His perfection of beauty, we are all ugly. And no matter how we look physically, in God's standard, we are all ugly. And in God's standard of expectation, only one man is beautiful. This one man, Christ Jesus, who was indeed the only beautiful one, became ugly, Isaiah tells us, became ugly as he was dying for our sins on the cross, so that all of us who are ugly indeed could be made beautiful. That's who Jesus is. So God was not partial. It is, it is men, we are partial in seeing Rachel as beautiful and Leah as ugly because our definition of beauty is skewed, it's flawed, it's imperfect, it's inadequate. I needed to deal with those objections before we dived into the passage that we're going to be looking at uh, this, uh, this, this morning. And it's important to deal with these objections. I, I deal with these objections because if this is your first time in a church, I want to respect you. I respect that those of us who do not yet believe in Jesus, but, and if you're merely exploring Jesus, I want to respect you by taking time to discuss the objections uh, that you might have to Jesus and the Bible, even as we discuss our devotion to Christ Jesus. Now that we've dealt with those two obvious objections some of us might have from the passage, let's dive into the passage itself. I'd like to draw just two things for us from the lives of Rachel and Leah. And even though this happened hundreds of years ago, I believe these are real and relevant to your life and mine uh, here in a city like Bangalore. The first thing I want to draw for us is simply this. Both Rachel and Leah initially used God just as a means to some other end. Rachel and Leah were both merely using God to get to something else that they wanted. Rachel had the love of Jacob, but she wanted children more than she wanted even God. And that's pretty much obvious in this passage. Leah had children, but she wanted the love of Jacob more than even the love of God. Both of them were therefore using God just as a means to some other end. 
And what I want to focus from this passage is how God deals with both of them. Verse 31 from Genesis chapter 29, the passage that we read. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. You know, it's quite easy to read this verse and limit our understanding of this verse. Um, this verse is communicating a lot more than what is perhaps initially uh, uh, visible. We could easily assume that Leah was ugly and unloved, so God gave her children. And we could assume that Rachel was beautiful and loved, so God didn't give her children. This verse might perhaps, in the first reading, initially suggest that. Uh, and it is true, but it's not just that. There's a lot more that is happening in this passage. God is drawing Leah to himself by giving her child after child after child. And God is drawing Rachel to himself by not giving her child for a long time. God is drawing both of these women to, them, to himself, but he is drawing them to himself by doing the opposite things in their lives. God is drawing these two women to himself using the very things they are using God for. In truth, in reality, both of these women were just using God as a means to get something else they wanted. Leah wanted the love of Jacob. She was just using God to get that. Rachel wanted children, so she was just using God to get that. And God was using the very things they were using to get, using God for, to make himself available to them. Let's look at Leah first. Her first son is born, and Leah's cry is surely my husband will love me now. Can you feel her pain? Can you feel her pain? The second son is born. The Lord heard, I am not loved. So he gave me another son. The third son is born. Now at last, my husband will become attached to me. Clearly, the greatest desire of Leah's heart is not, not God himself. Her soul is not satisfied in God alone. Come to think of it, even children is not the ultimate joy of her life. The ultimate love, the ultimate joy of her life is to experience the love of Jacob. If only Jacob loves me, Leah thinking and believing, then everything will be okay. For her salvation in practical, functional, real terms is the love of Jacob not the love of God. Leah is pining away for Jacob. And as the birth of three sons does absolutely nothing to change Jacob's disposition to her. Surely, there's a lot of physical intimacy that's happening between Jacob and Leah. How else are they having babies? But despite the physical intimacy, there is no love in this relationship. What is Leah's fault in all this? And she thinks that the love of Jacob is the ultimate thing in her life. And she's merely using God to get the love of Jacob. What about us? Do we all also not use God just as a means to an end? And I'm going to request us to put ourselves in Leah's shoes for some time. What is the Jacob in our lives? And as I ask myself this question, as I reflect on this in my own life, I have to confess that I've, there are things that I've created where I'm actually a lot more interested and a lot more passionate about than God. I, I'm a church planter, and there are many times in my life where I've caught myself in, in, in the sin of loving the church that God's called me to plant more than loving God himself. I call this ministry idolatry. Uh, I've also been working as a business journalist for 25 years, and there are many times in my life I've caught myself loving and pursuing and being passionate about my career. It's a good thing. A career is a good thing. It's a gift from God, but it cannot take the place of God. It cannot become the ultimate love of our lives. So the book that I've written, Grace of God and Flaws of Men, in the last six months, the biggest battle in my heart has been to love God more than to love the success of this book. And I have a great truth teller in my life after the Holy Spirit. This is my wife. 
And she makes it a point to remind me every morning or every time I, I'm getting carried away, uh, she reminds me that it is not the book. It is God who must be first in, uh, in my life. And Leah, here's putting God second. She's put the love of Jacob first. But at the birth of the fourth son, everything changes. When her fourth son Judah is born, Leah says, this time I will praise the Lord. This is a big change. The previous three responses are all about Jacob. My husband should love me. My husband should come back to me. But now when Judah, the fourth son, is born, everything changes. What changed? Just bear with me on that question. I'm going to answer that right at the, uh, at the end. That was Leah's story. Let's talk about Rachel. If God was wooing ugly Leah by blessing her womb, God was wooing beautiful Rachel by closing her womb. You see, ugly Rachel, ugly Leah, sorry, ugly Leah is broken, but beautiful Rachel, because of her beauty, is probably also proud and arrogant. Ugly Leah never got anything in her life. She never got any man's attention as she grew up. She doesn't even count herself worthy. She has self-esteem issues. And so, because of that, when she starts having son after son after son, she doesn't believe she earned it. She believed it's God's grace to her. But beautiful Rachel, on the other hand, always got everything in her life. And she had perhaps made to learn to use her beauty to, to win uh, people's respect, to win people's attention. And, and, and if she had started having babies right away, she would perhaps, in all probability, just assume that she deserved to have babies because she's beautiful. You see, beautiful people do get a lot of things in life easier than people who we consider, in the human perspective, are not so beautiful. So having children made Leah think of God, but not having children made Rachel finally think about God. God made Rachel wait, and this was absolutely necessary for Rachel's soul. Rachel didn't immediately turn to God. Even when she, she was struggling to have children, she did not immediately turn to God. She turned to Jacob first, and she became jealous of Leah. She picks up a fight with Jacob and says, give me children or I'm going to die. And when that doesn't work, even then she doesn't go to God, but she comes up with this invention of surrogate motherhood. So she takes her servant, gives him to Jacob, and says, sleep with her and give, give me a child, and that can be our child. Rachel is trying many things. She even boasts about her success in surrogate motherhood. But deep inside, she knows it's an empty boast. She is also monopolizing Jacob at this time in her life. Uh, to put it bluntly, Rachel is sleeping with Jacob every night. How am I sure of that? How can I establish that for us from this passage? Look at Genesis chapter 30, verses 14 to 16. I'll read that out for us. Very interesting incident is happening here. Uh, during wheat harvest, Reuben went out to the fields and found some mandrake plants, which he brought to his mother, Leah. Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, this is Leah telling Rachel, wasn't it enough? that you took away my husband. Will you take my son's mandrakes too? Very well, Rachel said. He can sleep with you tonight in return for my son's mandrakes. So when Jacob came in from the fields that evening, Leah went out to meet him. You must sleep with me, Leah said, told Jacob, I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. Slow, so he slept with her that night. This passage makes it pretty obvious that Leah is just not getting to see any of, Jake, any of Jacob. Rachel is monopolizing him. You have taken away my husband, Leah accuses Rachel in the passage that we read. So she buys Jacob for a night uh, by giving her mandrakes. What's the big deal about mandrakes? Why uh, does Rachel want mandrakes so badly that she's willing to let Jacob sleep with her elder sister Leah for a night. In that time and age, I don't know if medicinally if that's true or not, but in that time and age, people believed that mandrakes are fertility plants. And so Rachel is doing 
everything but turning to God. She will turn to surrogate mother good. She will, she will turn to mandrake plans, but she is not yet turning to God. She is not yet humbling herself in, in prayer. Things, um, um, maybe, I, th I think it's getting a little serious now. I think we need to laugh a little bit. It, it's always helpful to laugh, and, and humor is, is not my strong point, but I, I do think I'm going to get us to laugh a little bit. Imagine Jacob. Poor Jacob. He has a ruthless and a shrewd boss in Laban. And Laban is a slave master. He is driving Jacob. He's really making Jacob work, work really hard. I mean, Jacob is probably suffering more than any of the IT professionals here in Bangalore. He's probably doing a 16 hours work day. He doesn't have the traffic to deal with once he finishes work, but he's working 16 hours a day and he's probably really tired. And he probably finishes work and really tired and he comes back home and there are four women waiting at the door. <laughs> Darling, are you tired? Please have dinner. We have some work to do tonight. And one day, Leah can't even wait at the door. She goes out of the field to receive him. I have earned, I have bought you with mandrake plants, so you need to sleep with me tonight. Um, <clears throat> Jacob is having to contend with four women in a never-ending baby-making race. They made 12 babies in all. Rachel, as we can see from this passage, took a long time to turn to God, but eventually she does turn to God. But she turns to God only when she's tried everything else, and everything else has failed. Does that sound familiar? It sounds very familiar to me. This is a problem with most of us beautiful and successful people. We are so caught up in our successes that we do not go to God as the first resort. God is always our last resort. That's what's happening with Rachel too. Verse 22, then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled to her to conceive. It's not that God has forgotten Rachel. It's not that Rachel has gone away from God's memory. That's no true. We know that's not true of God's character. But God has intentionally made Rachel wait because Rachel is not yet seeking him. She is relying on, on her beauty. And here this verse says, he listened to her. He listened to her because finally Rachel prayed. How can he listen to her if she doesn't pray? And this is the first thing, a mention of Rachel praying, even though the same chapter mentions Leah talking to God, praying to God again and again and again. And so she named him Joseph and said, may the Lord add to me another son. The baby-making race doesn't end. Ugly Leah was quicker to turn to God. Beautiful Rachel took longer to turn to God, but the sad truth is neither really came to God as the ultimate end. They did not want God for God himself. They wanted God for something else. They were merely using God as a means to an end. Rachel wanted children more than she wanted God. Leah wanted the love of Jacob more than she wanted God. Both were using God, but God was wooing them in two very different ways. That brings us to the second thing I want to draw for us from this passage. Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. Who was the saddest of the three? Who was the most unfortunate of the three? of the three? Who was the most oppressed of the three? Who does your heart go out to the most? Let's look at these three characters, and please indulge me. I'm going to be a little sarcastic here, so please, please indulge me. Jacob, poor man. How much he had to suffer because he cheated his father and his elder brother. Do you feel pity for him? I don't. Let's look at Rachel. Oh, poor Rachel. What a burden it is to be beautiful. People are always noticing us. People are always giving us attention. We don't want all that attention. But being beautiful is drawing all that attention. Such a heavy burden to be beautiful. Would you empathize with Rachel? I won't. And I bet you don't. Uh, you don't too. Leah. Ugly Leah. So ugly that her father had to cheat Jacob marrying her. Leah, so ugly, so lonely, 
so unwanted, so despised, that she had to bribe her husband with mandrake plants given to Rachel to get her husband to sleep with her. Leah, I guess, is the saddest of the three. And that's the second thing that I want to draw for us from the passage. Christ Jesus is closest to the saddest. Christ Jesus is most intimate with the most unfortunate, the most oppressed of the three. Jesus was closest to Leah. Or put another way, in this season of her life, Leah experienced Jesus more intimately than Jacob or Rachel. Now, if you're familiar and if you're an expert in the Word of God, this is where you're going to stop me and say, please tell me, where does the Bible say that Jesus was close to Leah? Jesus wasn't even born at this point in time. Jesus is not even mentioned by name in this passage. He's born hundreds and hundreds of years later. So where is this connection with Jesus that you're pointing me to? If you recollect, I left one question unanswered earlier on in the sermon. We talked about Leah having child after child after child and being unsatisfied. And saying, yeah, now after the first son, now I hope my husband loves me. The second son is born, finally my husband will love me. Third son is born, I hope my husband loves me. Fourth son, Judah, is born. And Leah says, now, this time, I will praise the Lord. This time, I will praise the Lord. What changed when Leah's fourth son, Judah, was born? Everything changed when Judah was born because Christ Jesus descended from the line of Judah, Leah's fourth son. Of the 12 sons that Jacob had, Christ Jesus, because of a promise God had given to Abraham, had to descend from one of these 12 sons, and Jesus Christ descended from Judah, Leah's fourth son. Not Rachel's son, Leah's fourth son. Leah, of course, did not, at this point in time, realize the full significance. I'm pretty sure she didn't quite understand everything that was happening. She didn't quite understand that Christ the Messiah would be born from her womb through the line of Judah. But the name of Jesus, as we sung this morning, is so powerful that centuries before he was really born, the hint, the presence, the entry of her through, the, through Leah's womb was so powerful that in a moment, he made Leah feel loved. Ugly, unloved, despised, rejected, lonely Leah found joy, inexplicable joy, unexplainable joy, joy she could not comprehend. She did not become in one moment being, go from being ugly to become beautiful. She was just as ugly as she was when she conceived Judah and gave birth to him before, as before. Nothing changed. Circumstances did not change. But Jesus happened. Jesus was conceived in her womb and everything changed. And so Leah said, this time I will praise the Lord. Figuratively speaking, Leah carried Jesus in her womb. Ugly, unloved, rejected, depressed, lonely Leah carried in her womb the one who showed us the greatest love in all of the universe, Christ Jesus. When God called Abraham, Jacob's grandfather, God promised Abraham, through your seed, I will bless the nations. And Galatians 3 tells us that this seed was Christ Jesus. And so Abraham had two sons, and Jesus had to descend from one of these two. He descended from, from Isaac and not Ishmael. And Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And Jesus descended through Jacob and not Esau. And Jacob had 12 sons, six from Leah, two from Rachel, and four from the other two servants. And Christ Jesus descended from the fourth son, from, uh, through the fourth son of Leah, Judah. In this season, Leah was figuratively speaking closest to Jesus because she carried the line of Jesus in her womb. The ugliest of the two wives, 
the saddest of the two wives, the loneliest of the two wives, carried the seed of Jesus in her womb. The ugliness of Leah points to the ugliness of Jesus. Why am I calling Jesus ugly? He's infinitely beautiful. He is. But on the cross, when Jesus hung on the cross, he did not hang on the cross for his sins, but he hung on the cross for your sins and my sins. And then God looked at his son Jesus, his beautiful son Jesus, who was hanging on the cross, carrying all of your sins and mine upon himself. Jesus seemed ugly to God. And God rejected Jesus on the cross. God punished Jesus on the cross. It was the anger of God. It was not just the Roman soldiers. It was not just the Pharisees who, who wanted Jesus crucified. God had given up his son to die for our sins. And at that moment of Jesus' death on the cross, he was despised by his father who had loved each other for all eternity. And so when Jesus Christ thought, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is silence. A silence that Jesus took on himself because he was being punished for your sins and mine. The loneliness of Leah pointed to the ultimate loneliness of Jesus. The king of heaven and earth was lonely when he hung on the cross. All his disciples deserted him. God himself abandoned him. The rejection of Leah pointed to the rejection of Jesus. Leah was rejected by Jacob, but on the cross, when Jesus carried our sins upon himself, God punished and rejected Jesus. Because it is only through the punishment of Jesus that we can be forgiven. He was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. Jesus is closest to us when we are at our saddest. Jesus is closest to us when we are at our loneliest. Jesus is closest to us at our unloved worst. You and I, we have all been unfaithful to Jesus in our moments of success. We have not given God the glory that is due to him. We have not given God the worship. We have not given God the devotion of our heart that is due to him. We have abandoned Jesus. We have failed Jesus in our moments of success. But in our moments of failure, Jesus will not abandon us. And so if you truly desire to draw close to Jesus, if you truly desire to be growing your intimacy with Him, suffering is something we must learn to embrace. We must, we must, we must not uh, desire a life which is all comfort and no, no suffering at all. The Bible tells us we are not only called to believe in His name, we are also called to suffer in His name because Christ Jesus suffered in the believer's life. Suffering itself has been redeemed. No suffering that a believer endures will ever be pointless, will ever be purposeless. Every suffering in our life that God loves us, explicitly allowed by God, no suffering can ever enter our lives without the explicit permission of God. But when God allows suffering in our lives, Lives. It's only designed to be redemptive in our lives. Suffering draws us closer. Suffering is an essential part of, of discipleship. We do not need to fear or despise the sad and the lonely moments of our lives. Like God redeemed Leah's loneliness, He will redeem ours too. Yesterday I was at Velour. I went to meet a young man. His name is Peter. He's 27 years old. And about a month ago, he had just been selected to be a civil judge. He went through the competitive exams. He's from the Northeast. He's one of the youngest people to become a civil judge at the age of 27. And when he, about a week after he, he got that, and he got the great news that he was going to be, he's been appointed a civil judge. About a week after that, he was diagnosed with a tumor in his lung. And he came to Velour. He spent the last month in Velour. And the doctors in Velour tell him that this kind of medical condition, none of us in Velour have seen in the last 20 years. For the first, this condition is so, so rare that we are seeing it for the first time in 20 years. My son and I, we went to meet uh, Peter yesterday. He, was, he used to be part of our church before he moved to the Northeast. And when he went to him, went to meet him, the doctors had given him the verdict. They're going to try everything they can to remove the tumor, but they're saying that chances we don't know. So there is a good possibility that we might remove 
one lung of yours. You, you have to live the rest of your life with, with life with one lung. And I've been in touch with um, Peter over the last month. I have been expecting him to become bitter. I had been expecting him to become sad. I had, become ex had been expecting him to become angry with God at some point of time, but it never happened. All through this difficult time, all through this enormous challenge he's facing, enormous sickness he's battling, his worship of Jesus kept growing and growing and growing. Yesterday, when I went to encourage him and inspire him, I came back being inspired by his faith because Peter had understood and learned that Jesus is closest to him when he is loneliest, when he is saddest. Do not despise the difficult times, the lonely times, the sad moments. Those are windows, doorways, inviting you to a deeper, richer experience of Jesus. I want to close with just one thought. I want to bring this, this rivalry between Rachel and Leah to a close. I started off with the question, who would you rather be? And I, I, I'm guessing all of us assumed I'd rather be Rachel. And I think I'm going to change your mind now. I'm going to close with one last observation. Rachel died bearing Benjamin, her second son, and Jacob's 12th son. She was buried along a journey, the Bible tells us, on the way to Ephrath. It was a lonely and an undistinguished grave. No fame, no honor, no great placard saying, here lies Rachel. We read of this in Genesis chapter 35. Leah died many years later. She was buried on the instructions of Jacob in the cave where Abraham and his wife Sarah, Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. At the end of his life, when Jacob dies, he gives instructions. We can read of this in Genesis chapter 49. He gives, Jacob gives instructions to his sons on how to bury him. And Jacob tells his son, bury me in the same cave next to Leah. In the end, beautiful Rachel went to an undistinguished grave. But ugly Leah was buried next to Jacob. Who would you rather be? Rachel or Leah. I'm going to close, but before I do that, I think Pastor Ashish will come up and close us in a time of prayer. But I'm going to just take one moment. And I, last night as I was praying and this morning as I was worshiping, I just felt led to pray. Uh, if there are any couples here who have been struggling and waiting to conceive, uh, I just believe in faith uh, God wants to bless us. And I'm going to just take a moment to pray for us. And then Pastor Ashish will come us and, and, and bring us this morning uh, to a close. Father, we thank you for your son, Christ Jesus, uh, that he is shining all over the Old Testament for us. Uh, Father, we pray that even as uh, we've been spending time discussing Rachel and Leah, uh, uh, Lord, I submit to the um, prompting of your Holy Spirit, believing and praying in faith that there are, if there are couples here who are struggling to conceive, by the power of your word, by the power of the name of Christ Jesus, by his blood, would you heal them and would you enable them to conceive? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at abcwo.org. Also visit our website abcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.